So today, um, I'm going to talk about the vision of our church for next year. And we know that the Bible says where there is no vision, you know, the people perish. So it's very critical, no matter what size of the church, no, no matter what size of the, you know, the congregation is, I think it's very pivotal to have vision, clear vision. And so we must ground our ministry, our life of the church and upon this vision. And also to this vision, we must move forward. And I'm thinking like Christian vision is ironical because it's different from the worldly visions because the worldly vision is about having something new, something innovative, something creative, like blue ocean. While our Christian vision is something about old, familiar, something we've forgotten. Therefore, Christian vision is you know, restoring our old glories of Imago Dei, the image of God in us, returning to our old humanities you know, that we had before human fall and reviving our old songs and messages about God's unending love and his justice. And think about this lost sheep. You know, we, we love that analogy. We love that story, but we know that this poor sheep was being found by who? It wasn't he wasn't found by this new master, but by, found by his old loving shepherd. We also know the story of the prodigal son, and he did not continue his journey to find a new place, new destination, but rather the story is about he is returning to his old home where his loving father is waiting for him. And we also hear um, the wording from God to the church in Ephesus. And God's warning for them was not because of their lack of innovation or in creative thinking doing God's ministry, but because they abandoned their first love for God. God told them, think about how far you have fallen. Repent and do the works of love you did at first. Otherwise, I will come to you and remove your lamp stamp from its place of influence if you do not repent. So the ringing message in the Bible over and over, what we can hear is to repent and return to where we are supposed to be. So every time when you look at the church revival, where we see this great awakening happening, it is always about restoring restoring something old, you know, not inventing something new. So when the Methodist movement spread like a wildfire, people asked John Wesley, so what is this? Is this about new religion? And John Wesley's answer was no. Methodism is the old religion, the religion of the Bible, the religion of the primitive church. This is old religion, which is no longer than love, loving the Lord and loving our neighbors. And we know Jesus said, you know, of all laws, the most important thing is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with your old strength. And then Jesus said, the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So restoring and returning to this love was the heart of every Christian movement, and that's the vision of the church, not only to Smith Chapel, but has to be the vision for every single church who follow Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Only when we repent and return to this church vision are we able to be enthusiastic, meaning, remember that, Definition of the term enthusiastic means God within us, right? You know, we can be enthusiastic disciples only when, you know, we return to this loving God, loving neighbors, that kind of attitude and perspective. You know, we can have this missional spirituality, holistic holiness, as, and as Eugene Peterson puts it, we will live Christianly, by which our Father in heaven will be glorified. So what's the church vision? What's our Smith Chapel vision for next year? It's simple. Now, can we all say this together? Love God and love our neighbors. However, if my sermon ends here, our vision can easily turn into something work-based, not grace-filled. And that's not the gospel we believe. We must never forget Jesus' words. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I think this five um, words is very powerful. You know, God did it for us. That's the heart message of the Christian gospel. 
You know, think about this. Can we love God? Just imagine this. Can you really love God and love our neighbors as God intended? The answer is we can't. If we could have done it perfectly unblemished, then Jesus would not have to die on the cross in the first place. But this is the gospel according to Paul that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that we that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. So to simply put, the gospel is not about our works, right? You know, it's about what God did to us, you know, what God has done for us in replacement of our helplessness, our wretchedness, wretchedness, our incapability to earn our righteousness before God, you know, our doom. You know, because of our helplessness, our doom was the eternal separation from God and throw into hellfire. And imagine you are eternally separated from God. And you can call God in heaven, Abba, Father. And you will forever enslave to your sin and death. If that's the case, you know, how miserable you will be. But that's not the case, right? Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have eternal life. So only when we baptized, you know, I think the believing means baptizing ourselves into this God-given son, Jesus Christ. Only when we baptize into his death on the cross by which our sins will be washed away and his resurrection, you know, brings us to the newness of life, you know, so only when we believe, only when we baptize into his death and resurrection, you know, so, we, so as we can die to our sins and rise with the Lord. In other words, as we remain in him, Paul says, sin will have no dominion over us since we are not under law, but under grace. So this gospel message must be interlocked with the vision of Smith Chapel so that our being and doing, like loving God, loving our neighbors, is not based on our good works, but rather God's sovereign work by which we can glorify God of his grace and power in regarding our salvation. So now what? So our vision is you know, loving God and loving our neighbors undergirded by the gospel. So again, I, you know, I can end my sermon here, right? So our vision for next year is loving God and loving our neighbors and has to be grounded in the gospel. But if the sermon ends here, and I'll think this message will be something like pie in the sky. You know, if we have a clear goal, then we need means to get there. So I'm, I want to use this image of vine. So let's say our vision is this vine. Okay. And casting this vision is like we are casting the seed of vine. We are now planting this new vine, you know, on this very soil and, you know, on this ground, very ground. Now, we want it to grow, right? We want this vision to actualize and we want to see the visualize this vision. We want to this, see this vision of our Smith Chapel grow healthily and fruitful. And I believe that's my hope and that's your hope. But how we can help this vine, help this vision to grow and maximize its fruits. And I'm thinking it may need a trellis, <laughs> right? I mean, what does a trellis do? You know, it's, it's a wooden structure, right? That supports the plants in growing in a specific direction, as well as it can protect the plants from falling or trampling. So if we want this fun, if we want our vision to grow healthy and fruitful, we need some type of trellis. And I suggest three. Number one is transformational discipleship. Number two, multiplication. And number three, empowering lay leadership. The so number one, transformational discipleship. If anyone asks, like, can there be real Christianity without discipleship in the community? The answer is no. Now think about this. If we could be lone survivors, you know, if we don't need the church, if we know the, no, don't need like other church brothers and sisters, that Jesus would not have given us a church. You know, we must acknowledge that church is God's gift, not just for the sake of the world, but for Christians. Because it is through the church body 
Jesus' disciples will experience, practice, and demonstrate the divine community. And what I mean by divine community, where do we find the perfect example of divine community? It is from the relationship in the Trinitarian God, right? Because God, you know, our God three in one, and the essence of this Trinitarian relationship, you know, that we can learn from is this loving fellowship. God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they were somehow mysteriously and so, inter, you know, so intimately, you know, they are together. They're having this loving fellowship. And the Greek word for fellowship is koinonia. Probably you heard many times koinonia, and which comes from the adjective koinos, meaning common. Therefore, the literal meaning of having fellowship is to have things in common. And John um, M. Frame, who is the uh, New Testament professor at Westminster, he said this. I, I thought it was interesting. In the New Testament, there are two different types of sharing. One, sharing goods to help needy fellow Christians. Another is religious sharing, a religious commonness such as worship or prayer meetings. And he continues, both enable Christian experience of brotherhood or sisterhood, closeness, belongingness to one family in the Lord. So this means is this, through church ministry, right? What we can experience and foretaste and practice and demonstrate is that we, you know, we, we have this brotherhood, sisterhood. You know, we demonstrate this loving fellowship through which we love, listen, learn, and lead for the sake of God's kingdom. So John Wesley knew um, the significance of fellowship <clears throat> in Christian spiritual growth. He understood that preaching alone was in insufficient to keep people growing in their faith. He wrote, I determined by the grace of God not to strike one stroke in any place where I cannot blow, follow the blow. So he knew that long-lasting spiritual transformation is not the result of one great sermon, but it comes through the discipleship group. So once the people came to the Lord, this is what Wesley did. He intentionally and purposefully put them into Christian fellowship to follow the blow of salvation. He said this, and I, and I believe it's so true because he said evangelism and discipleship must go hand in hand, right? One of the things that Billy Graham later in his life regretted the most was that he was good at, you know, he was good at evangelism, but he was failed in disciple making. Evangelism and disciple making must go hand in hand and Wesley invented the structural forms, how to equip, how to nurture, how to have this transformational discipleship for these Christians. And I think we can learn and we can borrow this concept to apply our ministry to support our vision. So um, John Wesley had three different types of discipleship groups. One was societies, class meetings, and bands. And speaking of societies, I think we can apply it as our corporate worship. What we are having right now, what we are doing is like societies. So it means we have this regular Sunday worship, and this is a place where we open to anyone who wants to participate. So you could, including like members and seekers, visitors, guests, and non-Christians. And it's a place of education that included time of preaching, lecturing, public reading, and hymn singing sacraments. So that's one way how we can nurture and, you know, help, you know, the people to grow in their faith and also you know, pre um, um, actualize our vision. But there, that's not enough. You know, John Wesley invented another group, which is a smaller group, and he called class meetings, and I call small groups okay so you know it's it's like we, we are dividing the church members into smaller groups of five to eight each with a leader responsible for facilitating and leading the group and we meet in this you know this meeting for encouragement and accountability uh, so we meet at least once a week online or in person for prayer bible reading and mutual fellowship and we can use it as a platform to invite neighbors and friends 
who do not know Jesus Christ yet. And members can be from all ages and all backgrounds. And the tentative schedule looks like, you know, begins with a hymn or a praise song, Bible reading, a prayer. And once every other month, you know, do outreach mission together, like visiting the orphanage, senior center, prison, homeless, street evangelism, followed by giving a mission report at the corporate worship. And leaders' meetings will occur once a month. So, I mean, that's, you know, again, you know, the reason why John Wesley invented this and the reason why I'm addressing this, empathizing this, because it's really, really important, right? I mean, Sunday worship, we all know this, right? Sunday worship once, you know, just one Sunday worship is not enough, you know, in our, in our spiritual growth. So we need this small groups, you know, and, um, and, and Smith Chapel currently, we provide, you know, this type of sm small groups called Lectio Divina, right? Uh, Wednesday, 5.30 a.m., Wednesday, 8 p.m., and, when, and Saturday, 7 a.m., you know, and different groups we gather, you know, to read the Bible, and basically we are following the structure, but I, what I'm envisioning is that we have to make it more intentional, because not everyone in our church congregation are attending this, I hope. If the Holy Spirit leading you, then I hope you can involve it, you know, at least one of them. And, um, and that's not the end of the structure. John Wesley, he, um, he created one more called band meetings, and I'll say account accountability group. So it's more in-depth discipleship. So two or three people divided by gender, marital status, geographical locations, um, and they stay together for years until any revision is re necessary. So they meet once a week at least and, um, and provide a time and space where the group members could confess their sins and then encourage and pray for one another. So five, five basic questions that we can ask each other in this very small like accountability group. You know, how is it, how is it with your soul? Like, how's your soul? What are your struggles and successes? Do you have any sin to confess? Anything you want to keep secret? How might the Holy Spirit be speaking and moving in your life? Again, you know, all this structure is to help you to grow your faith and, um, and your relationship with the Lord. So, like, you know, one of the, you know, the things that we can do as a church to really implement and actualize our vision, loving God and loving neighbors, is by having some type of these forms. And, and, you know, I'll continue to encourage you, <laughs> and I hope you will be more opening and, you know, welcome the idea that, you know, like not only you come on Sunday worship, but also you, you know, more intentionally participate into the small groups. And if you can go further, you can be partnered with one or two people and really checking on one another, spur you know, spurring one another to grow your faith next year. Amen? Amen. Thank you. So that's one thing. We have two more trellies, okay? Number two, multiplication. Say it with me, multiplication. All right, thank you. So some of you may wonder, how many of you heard about this term, multiplication? Okay, a couple. All right, thank you. And some of you may wonder, like, what does that mean? Um, it simply means church planting churches. And multiplication is the goal of every living thing. Think about this. When God created living, you know, things, right? Human, humans or animals and plants. You know, one of the goal of our, you know, God's creation is to, you know, reproduction. He told Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply. And of course, it can be biological reproduction as well as spiritual reproduction. But we know that Jesus' grand commission for his disciples was to make disciples of all nations. But how often do we make excuses rather than obey what our Lord called us to do? Jesus said, I think this is very powerful. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. The harvest is full, but the laborers are few. Multiplication is the area, you know, I believe that our church must be serious about. Because again, this is the Lord's commands and our obedience is greatly demanded to express our love and loyalty to our Lord 
Because Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commands. On the same note, Dietrich von Heffer um, said, only he who believes is obedient. And only he who is obedient believes, believes. Faith only becomes faith in the act of obedience. So we know that obedience is the virtue for all Christians. As the Bible puts it, obedience is better than sacrifice. So if I can, you know, prophesy for next year for Smith Chapel, that we need to be more intentional and diligent in planting churches and making disciples. I mean, we are small. <laughs> but I, you know, I believe you know, we have, we can do this, right? And we're, yeah, we can do this. And as a matter of fact, you know, and so for your note, I put a new budget agenda uh, item called the multiplication for next year's budget. And, you know, because I think, you know, I really believe that we have to use God's money, God's resources for this purpose, right? I mean, God really want us to make disciples. God really want us to go out and plant churches, no matter what size we are, no matter how old we are. And, um, and that's our, you know, where our hearts should be. So we'll discuss it more later today as we uh, will talk about our budget. But, but in the meantime, I want to give you some information that, um, to your surprise maybe, we already started this multiplication this year when we supported this Hangyun Methodist Church in South Korea because you know, we know that the senior pastor um, is a North Korean defector and her heart you know, and her vision is to plant the North Korean, you know, plant churches in North Korea once the door opens in God's timing. So basically supporting her ministry is now we are, in a way, we are, you know, planting churches you know, we are multiplying God's churches on the other side of the world, right? So we are already somehow participated into this, you know, multiplication ministry. But what I'm saying is, but in the meantime, this multiplication must happen where we are. You know, not through someone else or, you know, you know, but through you and me. Because when Jesus gave this commission, right, you know, he wasn't giving this commission to a few extra ordinary people, but ordinary people like you and me. We must do it. So we'll talk about this more, but that's one trial least that we have to be more intentional, implement our vision next year. And the third and last one is empowering lay leadership. Say it with me, empowering lay leadership. Uh, yeah. Mark Bailey, he's a former president at DTS, Dallas Theological Seminary. So I took his class um, a couple of years ago and this is very something that really spoke to me. He said, discipleship is essentially a leadership. It is because the more we become faithful disciples of Jesus, the more we may impact the world in one way or another, because the more we get closer to Jesus, we become more like Jesus. So it is not we are impacting the world, but Jesus in us are impacting the world through us. So he will come from the inside out. And that's why the scripture says, in Jesus Christ, all people become a chosen race, royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, who proclaims the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And the great success of the Methodist movement was ascribed to the lay leadership. It wasn't a few gifted, ordained pastors like John Wesley who turned the world upside down but it was through ordinary, non-ordained, non-seminary, trained men and women, you know, who had a heart to promulgate the gospel of salvation mouth to mouth in their house or small group or even in the public spheres. You know, they are unquestionably the ones who attributed to the success of Methodist movement. The Wesley famously wrote, give me 100 preachers who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God, and I care not a straw, whether they be clergymen or laymen, such alone will shake the gates of hell and set up the kingdom of heaven upon the earth. On the same note, Gary, Gary, David Garrison said, in the church planting movement, the lady are clearly in the driver's seat. Unpaid, non-professional, common man and woman are leading the churches Lay leadership is firmly grounded in the doctrine of the priesthood of the believers. 
This recovery of the priesthood of all believers, an empowered lady, is a foundation for any successful multiplication movement. So, you know, so, so far, you know, as you know, you know, ever since I came here, you know, since 2018, you know, I was basically in, in front of the scene everywhere, right? I was running here and there, not that mean, and I'll slow down, I'll do nothing, but I'll do what I can do. But in the meantime, I think as God's church, you know, in 2024, I want to encourage you to, um, you know, to, to ask God's empowerment so that um, ask God, mobilize me. You know, God, use me. You know, I'm your instrument. I'm your royal priest. You know? So that's something that, um, that we need you know, as a church. So for this purpose, you know, now and onward, I'll be more intentional in empowering lay leaders. That's why a couple of days ago, I sent you know, uh, this woman's conference, leaders conference to several you know, woman uh, figures in our church and you know, pray about this, like, you know, just something like that. I'll, I'll, I'll be kept just, you know, um, ask you and encourage you and, um, and, you know, if the Holy Spirit is really, you know, stirring your heart, um, um, I hope you, not only the, just woman, but, you know, the man too, right? how, old, how old you are, you know, how busy you are, you know, the day is coming. You know, our Lord will come. Nobody knows when, right? And, um, we have to be ready for that day you know, because Jesus will, everybody here will stand before the Lord and he will say, so what did you do? You know? And I hope everybody in this church will not be ashamed by that question, but will gain the praise from our Lord. That's my heart. Okay, so, um, so, so far you heard the vision of our church for next year and onward, and which, which is to love our God and our neighbors grounded in the gospel. And to reach this vision, we will have three trellis to support our vision to maximize its growth and fruitfulness. And one is to have a transformational discipleship through worship, small groups, and accountability groups. Two, multiplication. We will plant churches and make disciples. And three, we will nurture and empower lay leadership. But here's how I want to end this vision sharing message. Let's imagine, okay? Let's imagine, so all of these worked out pretty well, pretty well, okay? So now we have this transformational discipleship, you know? <laughs> now everybody, you know, worships God and on Sundays and everybody is involved with this Lectio Divina and, you know, everybody is grouped with this two or three people in a, as an accountability group. And um, somehow we started planting churches in the Great Falls areas, in houses and, and schools and Katie's Coffee and so on. And we have worship services, you know, and, and, and we put our banner, okay? We put our banner on our vision everywhere, on our, wherever our eyes can reach, and the gospel message keep ringing in our eyes, ears without ceasing. But the question is, will we then... If all these things are happening, will we then witness the great awakening? Will then the dry bones come alive? I think of the prophet Ezekiel, you know, standing at the valley, because that's, I truly believe, where we are today. Where we are today is like a deep de valley full of dry bones. And when, when God asked us, son of man, son of woman, can these dry bones live? We may answer, oh Lord, you know. That we may prophesy over these bones and as God commanded, we, you know, we can do all these things. We cast visions, we preach the gospel, we run transformational disciples groups, we plant churches, we empower lay leadership. Then we may see some changes, a rattling sound and the bones came together, bone to its bone, sinuous and flesh, but it came upon them and skin and it covered them. And yet, and yet, when we look at the scripture, there was no breath in them. Still dead. And our frustration may continue. But here's real change. But once the wind blows, right? <laughs> once the wind blows, these dry bones lift and stood on their feet, 
and they became an exceedingly great army. And I believe that's what we need today. Therefore, you know, what we need is great outpouring of the Holy Spirit in this church body upon our vision. The one, one thing that Smith Chapel may need right now is God's Spirit blowing and, and, and showering upon us. It was the Holy Spirit, after all, that made the Methodist movement successful. That's why John Wesley said, Methodism is an extraordinary dispensation of his, his providence, meaning that this whole entire movement was not man-made, but it was God-given. So this must be, we must proclaim together as a wrap-up of this message. O Holy Spirit, come from the four winds. O breath and breath of these slain, that we may live. Can we all this read this together? O Holy Spirit, come from the four winds. O breath and breath, breathe on these slain, that we may live. So I believe the time will come because our God is faithful. When our hearts were strangely warmed, the time will come, and I hope that, that will be 2024, the Smith Chapel individually and as a whole church will be in love with God and love with our neighbors to another level if the wind blows. Amen. Let's pray. Father, um, we come together, Lord. Um, uh, the one who called us is faithful. But we truly believe that you will surely do it. It's just a matter of time and, and our yearning, our hunger, and our prayers. Uh, we think of these uh, 120 people in the, in the upper room who are waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit, the Pentecost. You know, they did not know when exactly um, your promise will be fulfilled. But, um, but they've been keep gathering and waiting and praying and yearning together. Uh, so Lord, uh, please help me Chapel to be the church of prayers, to be the church who are yearning for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit so that what we are planning right now upon our visions to love you and love our neighbors based on the gospel through which uh, these three trellis will be established by you. Um, for only for your glory. Um, so Lord, um, thank you for who you are and your words and always your word is a lamp on our feet and um, a way to our future. So thank you for that and um, continue to guide and empower us. We ask all this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen. Amen.